First of all, it was very difficult to believe, you know, that they could actually get to the point after all those years of the Soviet Union, and certainly my first 20 years, you know, being primarily concerned as to what do we do to keep the Soviet Union at bay, to have our leaders discuss getting rid of nuclear weapons was just, it was unbelievable. They couldn't agree to get rid of nuclear weapons, but more importantly from my perspective and my future was they also decided that they would actually have the scientists go from each side, Soviet Union, American side, to see whether we could develop the appropriate technologies to be able to verify a test ban treaty which had been on the books since 1974 but had never been ratified. These cities were so secret, they didn't even appear on Soviet maps. And all of a sudden, a few of my scientists and a few of the Lawrence Livermore scientists were in these secret cities, being hosted by Viktor Mikhailov and their scientists. It was incredible. I want to emphasize it's a historical event. And it's for the first time that in the Institute of Experimental Physics, this, this national pride of our country, we receive American experts. And it was those visits that really then brought together sort of the personal relationships that led me to go to Washington and to continue to sort of pound on the table to say, look, we're ready. You know, they the Russian scientists, the Soviet at that time, they want to talk. They want to be able to exchange visits. We need to do that because the world is changing dramatically. The seminal event, uh, really, that got the U.S. government's attention was in August of 1991. There was an attempted putsch, uh, and that is a coup from the Soviet hardliners who didn't like Gorbachev's policies uh, of what was called perestroika, sort of a restructuring, glasnost, an opening of the country, uh, and they put him under house arrest while he was down in the Crimea. And apparently they took away what we call the nuclear suitcase, and that is the codes that each president must have with him at all times uh, in order to authorize a launch of nuclear weapons or prevent a launch of nuclear weapons. Uh, and that really got the attention uh, of the U.S. government. And from that time on, from August through December uh, of 1991, there was a flurry of activities, uh, uh, both in the U.S. Uh, and on, on the Soviet side, to try to figure out how does one deal with the potential problems of having a Soviet Union that's going to split up. Plutonium used at Nagasaki was about six kilograms. Six kilograms in plutonium is the size of a grapefruit. Six kilograms of plutonium, one plane, that six kilograms of plutonium destroyed an entire city. Highly enriched uranium, it takes some few tens of kilograms. Significant quantity is 25 kilograms. So now you think about that enormous amount of nuclear material. And, and by the way, as we worry today a lot about North Korea, so the best estimate that I've made of North Korea plutonium holdings is, is, is maybe 20 to 40 kilograms. 20 to 40 kilograms of plutonium, that's it and highly enriched uranium, maybe a few hundred kilograms, that's all. And nevertheless, it's a major international problem right now. So they had one and a half million kilograms. The first unreal thing is, I get off the plane and Alexander Pavlovsky, the academician, comes up and he gives me this huge Russian bear hug as I get off the plane. Now, can you imagine that? 
I mean, we were still pointing weapons uh, at each other not too long before he welcomes me with a bear hug. As we speak and as we exchange ideas, we find that our problems are so similar. И как я уже упоминал, когда мы говорили, обменивались впечатлениями, мы мы обнаружили, что у нас очень похожие проблемы. And we are both driven by this intense sense of patriotism for our countries and for our people. И мы потрясены совершенно тем невероятным чувством патриотизма, которое каждый из нас испытывает по отношению к нашей стране и к своим к своей стране и к своим людям. So I come here with a very happy heart. Таким образом, я приехал сюда с очень легким сердцем. To now, to be able to work with you jointly. И теперь я готов работать с вами совместно. To make the whole world a much safer place. Чтобы сделать весь мир более безопасным. I went back in my old records and, and I found uh, this journal. And it's a journal that actually the Russians gave us when we arrived. As I went and looked through this journal, I took these exquisite notes of the things that we were told, of the places that we visited. And it's just amazing that I go in here and what they told, they shared their concerns about nuclear weapon safety. They knew all these weapons are gonna come back and the most dangerous part of the lifetime of a weapon is actually when you take apart an aged weapon. They shared their concerns about nuclear weapon safety, about nuclear weapon security. They said, we now need to be concerned about terrorism. This was 1992, not post, you know, 9-11. Uh, and that we ought to work together in, in these areas of safety and security. But what they were most proud about were the scientific accomplishments. And so they went through presentation after presentation, lab tour after lab tour, to show us that they are at the absolute forefront of those areas of science that are important to the nuclear business. And what was so interesting, they just took us through this laser lab, and, and I couldn't help but keep thinking, you know, our intel agencies must have spent billions of dollars trying to figure out what was in those buildings that they actually showed us. But of course, this was a response to what we did. You know, we took them through our laboratories at Los Alamos and at Lawrence Livermore. So we immediately, within a couple of months of my first visit in February of 1992, we were already planning joint experiments. Then we started sending people to each other's laboratories. Again, each other's, not just Americans to Russian, Russian to American. This, this was a joint activity. And within a year, we did this incredibly successful experiment. And it was beautiful in that it merged the superior capabilities on the Russian side, and these capabilities were for designing explosive generators that would be able to compress a magnetic field so intensely that you would get the world's most powerful magnetic fields. So we also had those gadgets, but they were better than we were at the time. However, we had diagnostics because of the U.S. capabilities in electronics and computers that were so much better than theirs. We put those two together, and in September of 93, we did the first joint successful experiment. And when that happened and the first traces showed up on the oscilloscope, one of our Russian colleagues, uh, Sasha Bikov, just went and picked up Steve Younger and lifted him in a bear hug to celebrate and say, look what we did together. It was that sort of jubilation that really led to our ability then to go in and work on the sensitive problems. You had to work on doing the good and preventing the bad. They wanted to do both. The US government was mostly focused on preventing the bad, and we the scientists brought this in. So that was the mark of the lab-to-lab -lab cooperation. We didn't look at this as a foreign assistance program. We didn't look at it as only a program that's gonna prevent the bad. We looked at it as a program where we develop, do things together, generate new knowledge, do new technologies, and then we'll also go ahead and solve these major problems. So as we look back now, of all of the things that were there, sort of post-Cold War, 
That was probably one of the most dangerous spots in the whole wide world. And we couldn't have taken care of it. Actually, my Russian colleagues call it liquidated the problem. Uh, we couldn't have liquidated the problem if we didn't have this cooperation. Three sets of scientists and engineers, and fortunately, a few really courageous government people in each of those countries. As we now look back 25 years later, uh, you look at the American concerns, the four loose uh, nuclear dangers. Uh, loose nukes, there weren't any. Loose nuclear materials, there was some concern in the early 1990s. Uh, some plutonium, some highly enriched uranium did manage to get out of Russia. Uh, but that was uh, stopped pretty quickly. And as you look now, back over those years, remarkably little material uh, got away. I would not have predicted that. Uh, loose people. Uh, that's actually what President George H.W. Bush was most concerned about in the fall uh, of 1991. They called it the brain drain, the concern about brain drain. In, in other words, you know, with the Russians sell their capabilities. At that time, the concerns were Iraq, Iran, North Korea, and so forth. Uh, for the most part, there was no brain drain. You know, there are a few uh, of the Russian scientists that had some connections uh, uh, with Iran from the best that one knows. But quite frankly, if you look at it honestly, not any worse than the United States. So not much in terms of brain drain or loose nuclear people. Exports, some concerns in the 1990s uh, about what uh, Russia did with Iran. Uh, but now, you know, some years later, Russia has become uh, a very respectable uh, nuclear exporter. If we had not done those experiments together, if we hadn't that sort of confidence in each other, you know, those one and a half million kilograms of uh, highly enriched uranium and plutonium would have been much less secure. So why, you know, why write a book? Well, if you look at the 25 years, I mean, what was done was just remarkable. And so one of the main reasons was to tell the governments that, look, when the scientists and engineers are allowed to work together, we can help to make the world a safer place. And we have, now as it turns out five years later, a thousand pages worth of evidence in this book both told from the Russian side and from the American side. This isn't just an American story. It couldn't have been done just by Americans. And in fact, the primary reason why we didn't have a nuclear catastrophe was quite frankly, the Russian nuclear workers uh, and uh, the Russian nuclear officials. I mean, what they did through these difficult times was absolutely remarkable. Their dedication, their professionalism, uh, the, their patriotism for their country uh, was so strong that it carried them through these times in the 1990s when they often didn't get paid for six months uh, at a time. It, it was a remarkable time. So we wanted to tell that story. We wanted the Americans to understand it wasn't just American money. We want the Russians to understand is that whereas the Russians look at the 1990s as often their lost decade, it wasn't the lost decade in the nuclear complex. The nuclear complex stood tall. The nuclear com complex did its job through the most trying times. Uh, and because of that, the world's a safer place. So we wanted to convince, my Russian colleagues and I, wanted to convince the policymakers that in things nuclear, to take advantage of what the atom gives you, or to make sure you manage the dangers of nuclear fission and things nuclear. You have to have cooperation. And cooperation was starting to tail off already five years ago. And we said, you must have cooperation. This book tells the story of how cooperation got us through this difficult time. Isolation, on the other hand, leads to disaster. <laughs>